is not just a nuisance, it's not just something that's false, it is something that is dangerously false. That there are those, I don't know how many they are, and that's irrelevant, who declare, and let me choose my words carefully so I am correct in I, my presentation of their view. And I'll tell you where they got the view from later. Who say that when Allah said that he made it appear to them that he was crucified, what happened was that when Auzu Billah Minaza, Allah caused someone else to assume the appearance of the Messiah. And that man was held and that man was crucified in the place of the Messiah. On Judgment Day, when they stand before Allah, He will ask them, Hatu Burhanakum, you said that I have done this, <laughs> that I caused an innocent man who never claimed to be the Messiah. I caused him to assume the appearance of the Messiah and as a consequence I caused him to be crucified. Unjustly so. It's an act of injustice. Even a schoolboy would know that this is an act of monstrous injustice. That someone who never claimed to be the Messiah and you cause him to assume the appearance of the Messiah and your, what you did now cause this man to be crucified for having claimed to be the Messiah when he was innocent of that. This monstrous act of injustice that you have attributed to Allah, you'll have to answer for it on Judgment Day. He will ask you, where is the proof? And such people who hold on to this nonsense will be in a very pitiable state on Judgment Day. Now then, we turn now to the second proof in the Quran having disposed of this roadblock. And the angel has come to Maryam salam, to inform her that you're going to have a baby boy. How old was she? Well, she was in the masjid, in the temple, until she reached the age of puberty. Now after this, she can no longer remain in the masjid because women have the menstrual cycle. So she returns to her mother's home. And it is shortly after this that the angel comes. So what will be her age? I think the oldest that I could possibly it will be about 14. So the angel comes <laughs> to tell her, you're going to have a baby boy. One half of Pakistan has no problem with this. But there's another half of Pakistan who will say to the angel, go back. She's still a child. Come back when she's 18. <laughs> Yes, <laughs> I am going, I'm entertained, I don't know about you, but <laughs> that half of Pakistan, which includes parliament, 
which includes your parliament. Go back. She said a child, come back when she's 18, telling the angel, go back. <laughs> it's so funny. The angel went on to tell her, this baby is going to be the Messiah. And she knows the subject. But the angel goes on to tell her two more things. And in these two more things are two more proofs of the return of the Messiah. The angel said about the baby who is coming, Your baby, your baby boy will speak to the people as a baby in the cradle and therefore miraculously so. Babies don't speak. Not even in Islamabad, babies don't speak. <laughs> nice to find an audience that smiles. This morning <laughs> I was with another audience. I couldn't get him to smile. <laughs> Babies don't speak. So this baby will speak miraculously from the cradle. And this baby will also speak as an adult. But there's nothing miraculous about an adult speaking unless he is dumb. But this baby is not dumb because he's speaking even as a baby. So how can an adult speak miraculously? Those who are bent on disfiguring the Quran and who cannot show integrity in explaining the Quran refused to accept that the baby was a baby when he spoke. One of them, a distinguished scholar of Islam, who translated and made a commentary of the Quran in English, uh, Muhammad Asad, a man for whom I have great respect, because he came to a different conclusion he has to twist, pitifully so, this statement, يُكَلِّمُ النَّاسَ فِي الْمَحْدِ And he says, a little boy, the little boy will speak. But it's not a little boy. It's a baby. How do we know that it's a baby? Allah didn't leave it to chance. When she became pregnant, and she goes by herself all alone, not even her mother with her. A terrifying experience for a girl having her first baby and all alone with no one with her. And the pain came upon her. She said, I wish I were dead. And then a voice spoke from beneath her. Could it be the baby? No. Because Allah says he will speak from the cradle and as another, he never says he speak from his mother's belly. <laughs> so it has to be the angel. And the voice told her that there's a date palm tree, shake it, you'll get ripe dates and eat it and refresh yourself. And there's a rivulet running beside you, take some water, refresh yourself. And then the voice went on to say that if anyone were to speak to you on this day that the baby is born, say to them, I have taken a vow of silence for one day, Al-Yawm, for this day. So Allah has given to her a vow of silence for one day. This is a girl. This is a man, Zakaria And when he saw her with food in the mihrab, 
He asked, where did you get this food? I didn't give it to you. She said, Allah gave it to me. So he went in the mihrab and he prayed to Allah, give me a son who will inherit from me. And Allah sent the angel to say, yes, your wish is granted, you'll have a son. He said, give me a sign. I <laughs> said, the sign is a vow of silence for three days. For a man, three days. For a girl, one day. It makes sense. You wouldn't give the man three days and give the girl three years, would you? It doesn't make sense. So when she gave birth to the baby and she returned to her people, she knew this is the Messiah. And when they said, Mary, Maryam, how could you do such a thing? Your father and your mother were not bad people. They already came to the conclusion that she committed sin. What did she do? Answer, she did not reply. She pointed to the baby. Why? There's only one honest answer. And that is that she had taken a vow of silence for one day. And the vow of silence was still in force. So this was still the day that the baby was born. You don't need a PhD from MIT to understand something so simple that the Ahmadiyya movement can never understand. And all the sheep and the cattle and the goats and the camels who follow Mirza Ghulam Ahmad, who have abdicated their responsibility to think and to study the Quran, they will never understand this. But you and I will understand. The reason why she was silent and did not reply to them is because she had taken a vow of silence for one day. While his was for three days, hers was for one day. And that vow of silence was still in force. And so this is still the day that the baby was born. So Muhammad Asad is wrong. And the Ahmadiyya movement is monstrously wrong. They say he was a big man already. <laughs> and we say, no, it is a baby in the cradle, one day old. She pointed to the baby. They said, how can we speak to a baby in the cradle? And then the baby spoke, hence, miraculously so, to defend his mother. We need not dwell on all the things that the baby said because we are only concerned with this thing. If he spoke miraculously as a baby in the cradle, how will he speak miraculously as an adult? when it is normal for adults to speak. There's only one way we can understand this verse of the Quran. That he will speak miraculously as a baby and miraculously as an adult. That's the only way. For people who think. And the only way he can speak miraculously as an adult is if he has not spoken so far miraculously as an adult. And there is no evidence. All prophets speak. And during his lifetime, he spoke like all other prophets. There's nothing miraculous in a prophet speaking. <laughs> what the prophet conveys from Allah, yes, that's the divine word, but the act of speaking is normal for a prophet. 
So there is no evidence that he has spoken miraculously as an adult. None. And it's too late to manufacture that. <laughs> there is no evidence that Nabi Isa alayhi salam spoke miraculously as an adult. And it is too late to manufacture evidence now. So there's only one way left. That he can speak miraculously as an adult. And that is that Nabi Muhammad والسلام, spoke the truth. That he will return to the world after more than 2,000 years. And he will speak to people. And that would be a miracle. That's the second evidence from the Quran. For those who take the time to study the Book of Allah. And now the third. The baby is born, or the, sorry, the baby is to be born. And the angel is informing Maryam about things that are going to happen in the life of this baby. And the angel goes on to say, وَيُعَلِّمُهُ الْكِتَابِ وَالْحِكْمَةِ وَالْتَوْرَاتِ وَالْإِنْجِيلِ And Allah will teach him the kitab. And Allah will bestow on him wisdom. And Allah will teach him the Torah and the gospel. Nothing happens in the Quran by accident. So why does Allah say kitab? Answer, because he wants to give you some homework. He wants you to go to the rest of the Quran so that the Quran will tell you which kitab it is. <laughs> And when you do that at the beginning of Surah to Ali Imran, you will see where the kitab is the Quran. Nothing happens in the Quran by accident. So Allah will teach him the Quran. But why will Allah teach him the Quran? when the Qur'an will be revealed only 600 years after he's left the world. He's gone. He's left. He's no longer in the world. And 600 years later the Qur'an will be revealed. So why would Allah teach him the Qur'an? when the Qur'an will not be revealed for 600 years. And then why will Allah give him wisdom? And after that, Allah will teach him the Torah and the Gospel. I did a whole lecture on this verse at the Iranian Cultural Center in Peshawar yesterday. And you will find that on YouTube channel whenever I get the Recording, inshallah. But today we are only concerned with this verse for one subject, and that is the return of the Messiah. There's more to the subject. Not only does the angels tell him, sorry, tell her, that Allah will teach him the Quran and give him wisdom and teach him the Torah and the Gospel, but more than that. In Surah Al-Ma'idah, on Judgment Day, Allah speaks to Nabi Isa Islam and says to him, Is Alam to Kal Kitab, did I not teach you the Quran? Well, Hikmah, did I not give you wisdom? What Torah, well, Anjil, did I not teach you the Torah and the Gospel? The verse is repeated. That one is future tense, this one is past tense. 
So now we have to try to answer the question. Why did Allah teach him the Quran and also the Torah and the Gospel? And why did he put wisdom in between? This is our answer. And if we are wrong, we invite you to tell us what is right. We say that the only way that this is relevant, or can be relevant, the knowledge of the Quran, is if he is to return. And when he returns, he's going to return to an Ummah in the Deen of Islam, which follows the Quran. And he's going to return to another Ummah in the Deen of Islam, which follows the Torah and the Gospel. But he's not sent to this Ummah, he's sent to this one. Because that's what the Quran says. Ya Bani Israel, Inni Rasulullahi ilaykum, I am the messenger of Allah sent to you, the Israelite people. وَرَسُولًا إِلَى بَنِي إِسْرَائِيلَ And the Messenger of Allah sent to Bani Israel two verses. So if he was sent to Bani Israel, the Israelite people, the first time, or who is going to be sent to on the second occasion? Do we have the authority to change the word of Allah? Haji, Bataye? Adi? Huh? <laughs> Do we have the authority to change the word of Allah? Haji, you do not have the authority. Only Allah can change his word. And when Allah changes his word, he replaces it with something which is better or similar. And he communicates that to us through his revelation or through his prophets. And Nabi Muhammad never told us that Nabi Isa is not going to be coming back to them. He's coming back to somebody else. <laughs> and so now our explanation is that this verse is conveying to us the knowledge that Nabi Isa Islam will return and when he returns he will need the knowledge of the Quran. Because he's coming back to an Ummah which follows the Quran. That is why Allah had to teach him the Quran. He's not coming back as the leader, Amir, Khalifa, but he's coming back as the supreme guide and supreme legal authority. And he's coming back to this Ummah, which he will lead. And he will rule the world as Al-Hakim Al-Adil, a just ruler. And so he needs a state to rule. And it will be the state of Israel, the holy state of Israel in Jerusalem. And since he will be the ruling state, he will rule, this is a ruling state in the world, so his followers will rule the world. And remember, one, two, three, four, five, remember? But after number five, and I'm going to raise you unto myself, and I'm going to purify you of the kufr that they have hurled against you. And I'm going to cause those who follow you to be raised to a position over and above and dominant over this other group which rejects you. And when I raise them to that position of dominance, they remain there until the end of the world. Do you remember or have you forgotten already? When you eat Dumba Karai, sometimes you forget, you know. This Ummah, which follows Nabi Isa, 
will now become the ruling state in the world. And Nabi Isa Islam will rule. And they will remain like that until the end of the world. So this Ummah is not going to rule the world. Of course, you can't talk to schoolboys. They'll never listen to you. So when he returns, he needs the knowledge of this Sharia. And he needs the knowledge of this Sharia. Because he'll be in between both. And what about matters where both this Ummah and that Ummah interact? How will you judge? <laughs> That's why, well, hikmah, Allah gave him the wisdom to be, because it's not going to be easy. It's not going to be easy. And as soon as he arrives, the challenge immediately begins. Because Allah sends him down in a masjid. Why a masjid? Why not a church? Why not a cathedral? Why not Hagia Sophia? Why a masjid? The divine wisdom is at work. And Allah sends him down at the time when the Salat is to take place. Why at this time? Nothing is happening by accident. The divine wisdom is at work. And Allah sends him down at the time when Amirul Mu'mineen, the Khalifa, the Imam of the Muslims, who at that time won't be Imran Khan, or Sayyid Ali Khamenei or CC or the one whose name I don't like to remember too much Erdogan <laughs> you think they will ever be able to unite this Ummah not nah, Mumkin <laughs> the only way this Ummah can be united under a genuine leader is if Allah does it. <laughs> we can't do it. That's why there's an Imam al Mahdi. And he is there in the masjid. And he's about to lead the Salat and he is the Khalifa. He's the Imam. He's Amir al Mu'minin. And Nabi Isa Islam comes down and the Imam says, This is the son of Mary. Like John the Baptist had said before him. And then invites him to lead the Salat and the first test begins, requiring hikmah. The Imam invites him to lead the Salat. If you are a Nabi, you must lead the Salat. Not the Imam, you are the Nabi. <laughs> but he declines. <laughs> he says, the people have appointed you as the Amir, you lead. And he performs a salat behind the Imam. This is hikmah. But Iran does not. <laughs> Iran doesn't know it as yet. Yes. If he had accepted the invitation to lead the salat, then according to this Sharia, the Sunnah, of Nabi Muhammad and the Imam had prayed behind him he would immediately have assumed leadership of this Ummah according to this Sharia but Allah did not send him to this Ummah so he would have made a blunder a blunder if he had accepted the invitation so he declines the invitation and the Imam leads and not because the Imam leaves the Salat and the Nabi prays behind him, does that mean that the Imam is superior to the Nabi? Iran, you have to go back and study. <laughs> so here is the third proof from the Quran. That this is the explanation that Allah says, I'll teach him the Quran and give him wisdom and teach him the Torah and the Injil. There is more that I can speak on this subject, but just to whet your appetite a little bit. <laughs>